Now let's try it with more audio. Hello friends. Yay. Okay. Looks like that's working. All right. Tell me, first of all, if you're here in the chat, say so, because I'm getting some fascinating, conflicting information. Like there's only one person watching, but there's a bunch of people in the chat and I just, I'm a little curious how that's working. So, um, yeah, if you're here, say hi, <laughs> That'd be great. And, um, and then, yeah, let's get set up a little bit. Um, Megan, you made it. Hey, welcome. I know this is, uh, usually not a great time for you. So I'm hoping that, uh, maybe the holiday week made it a little bit easier or something like that. So Grace is here as well. Okay. So that's at least two people. So I know that my one viewer report was lying. I uh, was a little curious how I had one person watching, but multiple people sitting in the chat. So that's fine. Yay. Good. Uh, welcome everybody. It is Tuesday. It is November 30th. It is the end of November 30th. I have 716 words left to complete NaNoWriMo and I'm here with you. So, you know, I appreciate you people. So <laughs> yes, there we go. All right. So tonight is going to be a little bit weird, a little bit different, and it might be a little bit short. I don't know. Um, cause this is going to depend just entirely on how we decide to play this. Uh, so I thought I would talk one of the things that I ended up doing during November, uh, counting toward my NaNoWriMo word count, uh, was I did a short story that was a pastiche of the eye of Argon and First of all, that was just tremendous amounts of fun for reasons that I will discuss in a moment, but I was talking about it with some other writer friends. Uh, and I you know, said that I was doing this pastiche pastiche is like, um, it's, it's like a tribute to, or in the style of, or can be just flat out, excuse me, straight fanfic. If you're doing fanfic, but you're doing it professionally, that's pastiche. So if you were to, uh, for example, uh, be, uh, get into a Sherlock Holmes anthology, something like that. That would be a, a pastiche of Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and if you are just doing it yourself at home, it's fanfic. Uh, but it can also be in uh, an homage to or in the style of. So <clears throat> in this particular case, I was not doing, <clears throat> excuse me, fanfic, strictly speaking. It was not the same world. It was not the same characters. Uh, what I was doing was, um, hey, let's take this icon and play with it a little bit. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so yeah, so let's talk about that. But before I get into that too far, uh, I just looked over and I saw the stack of books that I had left myself. So I am giving away a bunch of craft books that, uh, I have lying around my house, taking up space. And some of these are, um, these are all for, you know, craft books for writers. Um, some of these, or gifts. Some of them I found, some of them I picked up for free at events. Some of them are signed by the author. Some of them were used. All of them are free to a good home, providing I can ship them to you, which I'm sorry, Grace lets you out because Postmaster DeJoy says I can't ship things to you. So anyway, um, for anybody not living in a country that the United States Postal Service no longer services, uh, Please let me know if you want any of these. I have, what do I have here? You are a writer, so start acting like one. Jeff Goins. Your first 1,000 copies, Tim Grawl. Grace, I'm gonna explain the Argon thing. Yeah, and um, there, there's like a whole history behind it. I mean, this is a decades long thing, so we, we, will, we will get back to that. I just wanna get some book, book options on the table first. Freelance Writer's Desktop Companion. And I have revision for self-editing and publication. And then I have books in the How Done It series. Um, this is, there were, I don't know, like lots and lots and lots of these. Um, and I've probably sent out four or six of them already. Uh, I've got piles of uh, stacks of book packages waiting to go. Um, but Deadly Doses and Scene of the Crime are still available as are Body Trauma and Armed and Dangerous. So, 
<laughs> yes, Grace, I can use um, UPS or FedEx or something like that. The advantage of these is uh, since I am offering them for free, uh, I'm assuming they're, I'm sending them to people who don't want to spend a lot of money because really if you wanted to get these books, you could probably get them cheaper by just buying them from a bookstore. Um, so this is a, something that I'm trying to make available to people who don't have uh, handy craft books cheaply available to them. And if that's the case, <laughs> FedExing them is not going to be a cost efficient way of getting books to people, whereas I can send these media rate uh, through USPS and it will cost um, so far every package uh, the most expensive package I've shipped was five dollars and eight cents and uh, and I'm shipping some pretty big packages so we got this chunky fat boy here there's actually four books in this one <laughs> there's four books in this one and it came out to five dollars and eight cents so um, I'm trying really hard to make them uh, cost affordable for people so that was my reasoning there um, yeah, you could, yeah, as you said, you don't, not that you necessarily want these books, but if you did want these books, you could undoubtedly get them cheaper in New Zealand than me giving them to him, giving them to you for free and then paying the shipping, uh, since I would have to use FedEx or some other similar commercial carrier. So yeah, or we could just have a postal service that delivers like it was supposed to. Anyway. Okay. Um, so if any of those books, uh, if people want those, please message me with a shipping address and I will give you a shipping cost. And if that's acceptable to you, then we'll work things out. Please message me either within Twitch, not on any other platforms, or send them to my email, uh, which you can hit directly on my website or it's laura at lauravanarandonkva.com. Just pretty easy to remember. Not easy to spell, but easy to remember. Okay. All right. So field trip, field trip. Now we're going to go on our, our, our history tour. So, oh, oh yeah. Oh my gosh, less than $50. Okay, my gosh, now it's $50 New Zealand. So I have to do a little bit of adjustment in my head, but yeah, you should not be paying. I don't want you, I don't, I don't want you paying $50 for my books. We're, we're going to work something out. <laughs> that is, that is a lot. So, um, yeah, for $50 a book, I'll just hop on a plane. It will not be cheaper, but it will at least be a lot more fun. Okay. All right. Um, yes, yes. Maybe it's a better bet. Just wait till I come back and can carry them. Yes. That's, I think like that's the best bet. It's definitely how we should plan it. Okay. I have our gun. So, um, the year is 1970. And by the way, I have none of this in front of me. I'm going by memory, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to tell you things that are accurate. Um, the year is 1970 and a, uh, Oz fan, which is an Ozark science fiction fan, fanzine, um, publishes a short story by one of its sci-fi fans, uh, because it's a fan club fanzine. And this story is called The Eye of Argon. And it, what, what I need to express here is uh, the original story was written by a 16 year old. And I am certainly not gonna jump on the kids used to be less sophisticated, you know, whatever bandwagon, I'm not gonna do that at all. But I will say that this was a 16 year old who did not have the internet, who did not have um, possibly as many resources as one should have today. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say that, that probably did it on his own, not quite under the bed covers at night, but something like that. And, um, and then submitted a story to the fanzine, which published it. Um, I can tell you that he definitely did have a thesaurus. I'll put big money on the table for that. Uh, I'm going to say it's probably even an older thesaurus. Whether or not he had a dictionary, he didn't seem to take a lot of advantage of it. So um, one of the many features that this story is known for are, uh, is um, if you've ever seen, you know, the, the bumper sticker or whatever, that t-shirt, it comes up in many, many phases, but the, the, sometimes I use big words that I don't know what they mean. So I sound more photosynthesis. Yeah, that is, that, <laughs> here we are. This is, this is the eye of Argon. Um, like, uh, one just off the top of my head example, 
describing what is supposed to be an amazingly beautiful woman. Uh, and so he goes into great, dis everything is great description, so much great description. Um, but in, in all of this intricate dis description of this woman, he describes her lithe, opaque nose. Noses should be opaque. I mean, that's good. Not usually described as lithe, but okay. Um, that is not by any means the most egregious of examples, but it's just one of the top, it comes off the top of my head. Um, the, the story is known, uh, not just for its, uh, really amazing malapropisms, <laughs> substituting one word where you mean another, uh, all the time. Um, but it's incredibly florid purple prose, hyper purple, ultraviolet purple prose, but with about 40 to 60% inaccurate word usage. So it is just phenomenal and amazing to read. Um, so how this happened, like in 1970, this was published, this fanzine just happened, went around, no big deal. It has illustrations, by the way. Um, and fast forward a little bit and uh, editors were talking, several professional editors, and one of them was, um, was going to give a talk. And I don't know if it was at a conference or a fan con or, or where it was, but he was talking about um, writers that didn't, you know, aspiring writers, people submitting things to this editor. And uh, <laughs> Octarine, yes, possibly, whatever's past ultraviolet into not perceptible to the human eye, yes, uh, for the purple prose. Um, anyway, so this editor was, was giving a talk on aspiring writers who were submitting things to him that didn't really use the language properly. They, you know, where they were pulling out words they had heard, but not using them. And so he had several examples and someone else said, oh, I've got something that will illustrate that concept better than what, you know, the examples that you brought and pulled out this fanzine. And I am not even like, you cannot prepare yourself for this. This is generally agreed upon uh, you, you'll usually see this listed as the worst piece of writing in the English language. And I probably got to say is, yeah, it's probably, it's probably going to hold that <laughs> there as least as far as published work goes. Um, and where was I going with this? Uh, so it just kind of struck everybody as a ye gads, how did this get printed? You know, sort of thing, which the answer was, it was a submission to a fanzine, right? Like it's, there, there's not that much of a submission process and not that much of an editorial process, which we will circle back to. Um, but it's just, you know, phenomenally bad. And so people started sharing it around, you know, it started at this, um, this uh, convention and, and began to spread. And it actually became a party game at uh, sci-fi cons in the, over the next few decades uh, where you would have, you know, an event, a scheduled event of an Eye of Argon reading. And, you know, imagine like it's, uh, you know, kind of like the, 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 the Rocky Horror Show, you know, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, everybody's getting together and, um, you know, throwing toast and all the things because everybody at this point knows what's coming. Nobody's surprised at it. The process is getting through it. And so you would have somebody attempt to read the manuscript and you would go as far as you could without breaking into tears or laughter. And, um, and frequently this is merely a few words. <laughs> so anyway, um, that, that became a party game. Now, jumping back where I have a little bit of guilt about this is, um, you know, this was done by a kid with no guidance and, um, and th this is people making fun of it decades later. So, you know, he's, he's grown up now, right? He was aware of this. Can one still read the story? Oh yes. Oh, oh yes. Like ho hold on. We're coming. We're, well, it'll happen. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I will, I will share with you. Um, <laughs> but, um, the, uh, the, the, the guy, you know, was, was aware he was still a science fiction fan. He was still, you know, kind of in the community. Um, actually had a related business, I think, and was completely aware uh, that people were mocking his work. 
he was actually quite proud of it, not necessarily later when he was 40, but you know, he was still proud of the fact that he had been published at 16. Um, and you know, he's like, and I, I read a quote from him once at some point, it's like how many 16 year olds, you know, can be published and especially go back to, um, you know, we're in an area pre self publishing where we're way before, um, uh, what's the guy, um, the Aragon guy whose parents self published him and then drove him around on a book tour and stuff. But anyway, um, we're, we're way back before that. So, you know, I'm sure it did feel like a huge deal to him to get published in this fanzine. Um, and, um, sorry, I'm gonna try to silence the thing that's going on over here. Anyway. Um, and, and, and yes, I, I think it's, his, his name should have been detached from it. We, we, there's, there's a lot of things. Um, there's, there's an entire, uh, case study and life lesson to be said here about, yes, you need to be cautious about the first thing you publish because you get one chance to make a first impression. You know, if that guy had, had written a book 20 years later, <laughs> we never would have overcome, you know, what he was actually known for, uh, all of these things. Um, that said, you know, uh, I, I, I back up. I think we absolutely need to not mock Jim, uh, for, for that, you know, Jim, six year old kid, totally caught up. Dear goodness, there's a lot of things that I wrote at 16 that should not have seen the light of day, you know, that sort of thing. I, I'm completely sympathetic to that. That said, I think we can still laugh at the work if we detach it personally in the same way. This is the way that it works in my head. And if you feel differently about this, that's fine. This is the way this works in my head. Those forwards that go around, um, used to be email with forwards. Now they're social media memes because that's how we do it. But we still share them of, you know, stupid things kids say or dumb answers that kids put on homework and those kinds of things. And, um, and you know, we laugh at them. No, I'm not mocking that specific child who said that. I'm laughing at how a concept got mangled or something like that. And I think you can do the same thing with Eye of Argon. It's also kind of fun to look at from a structure and craft perspective because you know the example um that i heard once and um, when i talk about uh uh pacing and uh an exposition uh when i when i do those talks and i use this example of you know somebody told me when you look at a watch that's working it just it just looks good and it's working and it looks like a well-run unit but when you look at a watch that's broken, not a digital watch, you know, like a smashed up pocket watch kind of thing, you can see all the springs and the gears and the way things are supposed to fit together and you can see why it doesn't. So sometimes looking at something that's broken can be educational as well as looking at something that is well running. And the eye of Archon is definitely broken. <laughs> so. Yeah. Oh, hi. Hello, Shy Red Fox. Oh, Grace, your con did miss this tradition. I'm sorry. We can, we can fix that when I come back. We will, uh, we will have that. So, uh, anyway, I will, um, I'm going to attempt to read some of the Eye of Argon for you and, uh, and we'll see how far I get. I'm, I'm, I'm usually pretty good at keeping a straight face about things, but this is pretty special. Um, and where, where was I going? And then, and, then I, and then I will talk about what I did with my story. So <laughs> why I was doing a pastiche of the Eye of Argon, so I should probably mention that. Um, I just sent it off last night uh, to an anthology that is a fandom convention-centric anthology. And they, they wanted a collection of very specific stories. And um, so I made my pitch to the editor. This is uh, this is a little bit different where you don't, I'm not writing the story and then sending the story in. I actually, you know, queried with an idea and then I'm sending the story in. And, um, and I said, I can do this, you know, a, you know, Japanese historical fantasy, or I can do an Eye of Argon pastiche, which is a heck of a choice. Okay. But I'm keeping my options open. And, um, and he wrote back and he's like, well, I'm really curious about a story written deliberately badly. So that's what I did. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't know if it's going to make it in honestly, because like, it's, uh, let me say, I'm, I'm, I enjoyed doing it. I had a lot of fun doing it. It is wonderful in its own grotesquely awful way. And if it doesn't get picked up for the anthology, then it's going to my Patreon, uh, family. Um, not because I don't like my Patreon family, but because they get uh, bonus stories and stuff. And, um, and that's going to be something from me that nobody else will have seen. 
Um, and, I, and I do think it's, uh, it holds up on its own. What the reason it might not fit into the anthology is if you have a 19, you know, serious, straightforward stories, and then something like that, <laughs> it is, it can stand out a little bit. Now it's not just straight written that way. It's actually within a frame story. So we switch back and forth between like what my writing voice normally sounds like. And then we shift over into barbarian, uh, centric Argon voice. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Anyway, that is why I was working on it. And uh, then that's why I was talking about it. And then that's why I re how I realized not everybody in the speculative fiction world remembers the Eye of Argon, which is uh, a thing. <laughs> so let me hop over. Where did I leave my manuscript? Here it is. Okay. Give me just a moment to get the Eye of Argon properly on my screen. And to embiggen this text a little bit. Now, I talked to, I think it was Kate today, um, and I, she said uh, that she had attempted to read The Eye of Argon once and made it four paragraphs in and quit. And I said, that's, that's not even to the good parts yet. Um, so I'm going to skip around a little bit because I, I, I we'll, we'll start with the, we'll start with the, with the front end. That'd be good. Um, and then we'll jump around to some of my favorite parts because, because also I need to, uh, so, sometimes I, 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 I don't know yet if I will interrupt to, to express the, the visual of this story as well. Um, where frequently like the word facet will actually be spelled faucet which changes the meaning a little bit and things like that. So there's just a lot of fun stuff going on here. But the, the beginning starts fairly straightforwardly just with a lot of description. We're not to the, anything crazy yet. We're just into a little bit of, you know, mildly purple prose. Okay. And, oh, oh, oh wait, wait, wait. Where's my, here we go. Okay, okay. The Eye of Argon. The weather-beaten trail wound ahead into the dust-racked climbs of the barren land which dominates large portions of the Norgolian Empire. Age-worn hoofprints smothered by the sifting sands of time shone dully against the dust-splattered crest of earth. That's two dust. The tireless sun cast its parching rays of incandescence from overhead halfway through its daily revolution. Small rodents scampered about, occupying themselves in the daily accomplishment of their dismal lives. Dust spread over three heaving mounts in blinding clouds while they bore the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. Prepare to embrace your creators in the Stygian haunts of hell, barbarian, gasped the first soldier. Only after you have kissed the fleeting stead of death, wretch, returned Grignir. I don't know what a fleeting stead is either. A sweeping blade of flashing steel riveted from the maps of Barbarian's hide-enameled shield as his rippling right arm thrust forth, sending a steel-shod blade to the hilt into the soldier's vital organs. The disemboweled mercenary crumpled from his saddle and sank to the clouded sward, sprinkling the parched dust with crimson droplets of escaping life fluid. The enthused Barbarian swill swilled about, his shock of fiery red hair tossing robustly in the humid air currents as he faced the attack of the defeated soldier's fellow in arms. I like how the desert is humid. That helps. Damn you, barbarian, shrieked the soldier as he observed his comrade in death. A gleaming scimitar smote a heavy blow against the renegade's spiked helmet, bringing a heavy cloud over the accordion's misting brain. Shaking off the effects of the pounding blow to his head, Grignir brought down his scarlet-streaked edge against the soldier's crudely forged hauberk, clanging harmlessly to the left side of his opponent. The soldier's stead whinnied as he directed the horse back from the driving blade of the barbarian. Grignir leashed his, leashed his mount forward as the hoarsely piercing battle cry of his wilderness-bred race resounded from his grinding lungs. A twirling blade bounced harmlessly from the mighty thief's buckler as his rolling right arm cleft upward, sending a foot of blinding steel ripping through the Cimmerian's exposed gullet. 
a gasping gurgle from the soldier's writhing mouth as he tumbled to the golden sand at his feet and wormed agonizingly in his deathbed. What sentences need verbs? We don't need verbs. All right, I'm just going to finish this scene and then, we'll, then we're going to jump on to uh, uh, some good stuff. <laughs> Grigner's emerald green orbs glared lustfully at the wallowing soldier, struggling before his chestnut swirled mount. His scowling voice reverberated over the dying form in a tone of mocking mirth. You city bred dogs should learn not to antagonize your better. Reining his weary mount ahead, Grigner resumed his journey to the Norigolian city of Gorzam, hoping to discover wine, women, and adventure to boil the wild blood coursing through his savage veins. The trek to Gorzim was forced upon Grignir when this the trek to Gorzim was forced upon Grignir when the soldiers of Kryn were leashed upon him by a faithless concubine he had wooed. His scandalous activities throughout the Samarian city had Heavy, had unleashed throngs of havoc and uproar among its refined patricians, leading them to tack a heavy reward over his head. He had barely managed to escape through the back entrance of the inn he had been guzzling in, as a squad of soldiers tounced upon him. After spilling a spout of blood from the leader of the mercenaries as he dismembered one of the officer's arms, he retreated to his mount to make his way toward Gorzam, rumored to complain hordes of plunder and many young wenches for any man who has the backbone to west them away okay so let's see one second here I want to redo some good parts because that's not the good parts that's just how we open you can still discern what's going on there So, uh, yeah, what we have, like, we, st I mean, come on, like, we start in media res. It's a good start, right? Um, we've got, uh, action going on. Lots of action, lots of dust, humid dust, very humid dust. Um, and... I'm sorry, I was just, just scrolling past things. I was like, oh, right, this scene. Um, trying to scroll on. Um, so anyway, uh, but but yeah, we get, we get a little bogged down with maybe a lot of description and a lot of overwrought description. So here we go, writing lessons from the Eye of Argon. Um, okay, I want to jump to a scene where Grignir fight battles a rat. Um, so he has... Oh gosh, I, 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 can I skip the part where he meets the girl? I kind of want to, I need to skip the part because we don't have time to do all of this. Um, yeah, so he, he, he goes and he starts, um, where is it? Was this, um, I got to get where he is. <laughs> So he goes into, um, this is where he meets the woman with the lithe, opaque nose. Let me just do this scene um, here. The flickering torches cast weird shafts of luminescence dancing over the half-naked harlot of his choice, her stringy, orchid twines of hair swaying gracefully over the lithe, opaque nose as she raised a half-drained mug to her pale red lips. Glancing upward, the alluring complexion noted the stalwart giant as he rapidly approached. A faint glimmer sparked from the pair of deep blue ovals of the amorous female as she motioned toward Grignir, enticing him to join her. The barbarian seated himself upon a stool at the wench's side, exposing his body, naked save for a loincloth brandishing a long steel broadsword. I have questions. An iron spiral battle helmet and a thick leather sandal. Zzz. To her unobstructed view. Thou hast need to occupy your time, barbarian. Question the female, question mark. Only if something worth offering is within my reach, stated Grignir, as his hands crept to embrace the tempting female who welcomed them with open willingness. 
From whence do you come, barbarian, and why what are you called? gasped the complying wench, as Grigner smothered her lips with the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. We're going to do one more paragraph. The engrossed titan ignored the queries of the inquisitive female, pulling her towards him and crushing her sagging nipples to his yearning chest. Without struggle, she gave in, winding her soft arms around the harshly bronzed hide of Grigner corded so shoulder blades as his calloused hands caressed her firm protruding busts. You make well love well, wench, admitted Grigner. So, um, yeah, and then the, he gets in a fight and he kills a guy, and so he goes before the local magistrate, noble, judge, prince thing um, who lives in a chateau, and, um, and he, anyway, he ends up in a dungeon. That's what a scene where I actually really need to share with you is when he fights the rat, because it's awesome. Okay, here we go. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yes. Yeah, it's like, honestly, it's an experience. Like, it really is an experience. And it is worth reading just for the I've been there and done that of it. But, um, but you know, like, also, like, you can look at it and go, if we, if we, gave you a dictionary to go with your thesaurus, you know, could probably, probably get there. Okay. Yeah. So let's go ahead and let's, um, let's fight this rat and then let's see where we are. Also, apparently I'm doing really well cause I haven't cried or laughed like in the middle of a sentence yet. So yay. Okay. Mm. Okay. So we're in the, we're in the pit, the dungeon, the pit, and he is, he is hearing scampering footfalls. My words. Okay. <laughs> All right. Grignir threw up his hands to shield his face and flung himself backwards upon his buttocks. A fuzzy form bounded to his hairy chest, burying its talons in its flesh while gnashing toward his throat with its grinding white teeth, its sour fetid breath scorching the squirming barbarian's dilating nostrils. Grignir grappled with the lashing flexor muscles of the, <laughs> the lashing flexor muscles of the repugnant body of our gargantuan brown-hided rat, striving to hold its razor teeth from its juicy jugular as its beady gray organs of sight glazed into the flaring emeralds of its prey. Taking hold of the rodent around its lean, growling stomach with both hands, Grignir pried it from his crimson rent breast, removing small patches of flayed flesh from his chest in the motion between the squalid black claws of the starving beast. Holding a rodent at an arm's length, he cupped his right hand over its frothing face, contracting his fingers into a vice-like fist over the quivering head. Retaining his grips on the rat, Grigner flexed his outstretched arms while slowly twisting his right hand clockwise and his left hand counterclockwise motion. The rodent let out a tortured squall, drawing scarlet as it violently dug its flome-fecked fangs into the barbarian's sweating palm, causing his face to contort to an ugly grimace as he cursed beneath his breath. With a loud crack, spoiler, rodent dies. Little gory. No, Grace, this is cold. I'm reading this cold. I'm so proud of me, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I just did not prep for this. All right. With a loud crack, the rodent's head parted from its squirming torso, sending out a sprinking shower of crimson gore and trailing a slimy string of disjointed vertebrae, snapped trachea, es esophagus, and jugular, disjointed hyoid bone, morose purpled stretched hide, and blood seared muscles. Got all that? <laughs> Megan suddenly realizes I might win nano if I added more adjectives, right? Maybe that's what I'll do. I have 716 words left and they will all be purple adjectives. Uh, okay. Da, 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 blood, purple, purple stretched hide, blood seared muscles. Flinging the blo broken body to the floor, Grignir shook his blood streaked hands and wiped them against his thigh until dry, then wiped the blood that had showered his face and from his eyes. 
Again, sitting himself upon the jagged floor, he prepared once more he prepared to once more revamp his glum meditations. He told himself that as long as he still breathed the gust of life through his lungs, hope was not lost. He told himself this, but found it hard to comprehend in his gloomy surroundings. Yet he was still alive, his bulging sinews at their peak of marvel, his struggling mind floating in a myrrhal of impressed excellence of thought. Plot after plot sifted through his mind in inter energetic contemplations. Then it hit him. Minutes may have passed in silent thought or days, he could not tell, but he stumbled at last upon a plan that he considered as holding a slight margin of plausibility. He might die in the attempt, but he knew he would not submit without a final bloody struggle. It was not a foolproof plan, yet it built up a store of renewed vortexed energy in his overwrought soul. Though he might perish in the execution of the escape, he would still be escaping the life of infinite torture in store for him. Either way, he would still cheat the gloating prince of the succored revenge his sadistic mind craved so clearly. Succored. Succored. Revenge. The guards would soon come to bear him off to the prince's buried mines of dread, giving him the sought-after opportunity to execute his newly formulated plan. Groping his way along the rough floor, Grignir finally found his tool in a pool of congealed gore. The carcass of the decapitated rodent, the tool that the very filth he had been sentenced to spawned. When the time came for action, he would have to be prepared, so he set himself to rending the sticky hulk in grim silence, searching by the touch of his fingertips for the lever to freedom. All right. Um... <laughs> This is, uh, the, the next scene is, is, uh, just a, a whole nother level of amazing. Um, and it is, it, it, it's where the, the girl is about to be sacrificed on the, uh, to, to the evil, evil deity Argon. He has an eye, you may have heard of it. Um, and, uh, the, uh, the eye of Argon is a scarlet emerald that's set in the middle of his forehead. So I need to preface this with content warning, sexual assault, but probably not the kind that's likely to be triggering actual flashbacks, I guess is probably the best way to say that. Um... Let me see. We'll just, I'll, I'll just, I'll just read the, the, the one good, the a, a great paragraph here. Um, and what we have here is we have our, our one girl who is, um, naked except for a jeweled harness around her boobs. Um, and we have a group of priests who, if you have, who are, who are described as priests and they're described as acolytes and they're described as a shaman, a group of shaman, um, pluralized shaman, because if you have one shaman, then you have a group and it's shaman. So, <laughs> yes, Grace says, emeralds come in scarlet. Yes. So what's interesting here is technically there is a mineral that is referred to casually as scarlet emerald. Uh, so you could either say that he was actually referring to this very specific, very rare mineral that, um, that has another name, but can be referenced as Scarlet Emerald, or perhaps did not know what the words Scarlet or Emerald meant. And I would suggest there is evidence for category B, but let's generously say that he possibly was referencing this very rare element that can sometimes be called Scarlet Emerald. So there we go. All right. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to read you this, this great thing where the, the priest is now closing on the naked female. The vile stench of the shaman's hot fetid breath came over, overcame the nauseated female with a deep soul searing sickness, causing her to wrench her head backwards and regurgitate a slimy orange white stream of swelling gore over the richly woven purple robe of the enthused acolyte. 
The priest's, lisp, the priest's lips trembled with a malicious rage as he removed his callous paws from the girl's arms and replaced them with tightly around her undulating neck, shaking her violently to and fro. The girl gasped a tortured groan from her clamped lungs, her sea-blue eyes bulging forth from damp sockets. Cocking her right foot backwards, she leashed it desperately outwards with the strength of a demon possessed, lodging her sandaled foot squarely between the shaman's testicles. Between. Between. Also, I like the fact that she is not possessed by a demon. This is, she is as strong as if something else had possessed a demon. That's, I mean, that's innovative. That's out of the box thinking. So anyway, um, yeah, that's enough of that. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to share that because, um, it's worth taking a read and, and then because we are a writing, uh, centric, uh, stream here, um, go ahead and look at it. And first of all, like, yes, do enjoy what language can do if you twist it hard enough, but also look at, okay, why is it having this effect? Why do we think, you know, this is funny and you know, how important a word choice is. Uh, I am a personally a fan of the concept that there are no true synonyms in English. Okay. We have lots of words that, uh, that are similar in meaning, but quiet and silence are not exactly the same, right? And if I use the word ocean, or if I use the word sea, you're going to get a slight different tonal difference and a mood change. Okay. Cause English is just ridiculously hyper rich with, uh, shades of meaning. So, uh, so anyway, um, just, yeah, look, <laughs> let this be an educational journey as well, but also just enjoy the ride because <laughs> it really is a ride. It really is a ride. So, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, so the story, oh, I want to go back to the, the history. So for years, for years, um, the story was passed around, but it just cut off like abruptly at the end. And people just thought it had a really terrible ending. Um, and then later somebody found the original fanzine cause you know, photocopies had been made. Somebody found the original fanzine and the last page had been torn off from the copy that had been shared around mimeographed Xerox to all the things that were happening in the seventies and eighties. Uh, and so when they found the original, they found the missing page with the last ending. So it actually does go on for like another half page or a page. So it's not just that it had a really terrible ending. It has another page and then it has a really terrible ending. So uh, make sure I'm going to actually drop a link into the chat. Um, because you will, you can still find, um, versions that are missing the ending and you want to make sure you get the full effect. So yeah, Megan says, I have to give it to the author though. He was committed. You know, he really was. And, and I, as the thing, like, I don't want to make this personal, like again, who among us has not written terrible self-insertion fanfic or, uh, you know, uh, just my ridiculously over the top, um, you know, oh man, I really like this. I'm going to uh, do my own version of it, which is exactly what's going on here, right? Like this is Conan and Sonia and all of those things just cranked to 14 without any craft experience, you know, built in. Right. So, uh, you know, everybody has done that. Every, you know, people who say they haven't done that have just forgotten that they did do that. Okay. The, whether or not you wrote it down, you definitely did it in your head. Just some people didn't have the, uh, the, the, the spine and the grit to actually put, commit it to paper. And this guy did. So bravo to him. Right. And, um, <laughs> it feels oddly familiar as if many tales carry its echo or vice versa. Yes. Again, because this is very much like, wow, I really like Conan and Red Sonia and all of those, um, you know, that whole category that the sword and sorcery genre was big and it varied widely in quantity, but it didn't have, there was a lot of, there was a reason we got the thud and blunder essay. Okay. If you've heard, you know, blood and thunder, common phrase. Um, and then thud and blunder was a, oh gosh, who did that? Um, it wasn't Pierce Anthony, was it? Who was it? Um, we can Google that, but, uh, 
but he did a great essay critiquing uh, the sword and sorcery, sandals, you know, all that kind of kind of genre, um, and just how you know over over the top it had gotten. Which, hey, by the way, I write about you know people with six limbs jumping between dimensions, so over the top is not necessarily the problem. You can do anything you want. It's all about execution. Execution, tone down the purple prose. <laughs> okay, so I did that to Superman when I was nine and I still have it. Yes, absolutely, right? Like, absolutely. I, I have, uh, I had a, a, a Zorro fanfic. Okay, yeah, like, come on, everybody, you know, we get to do that. That's that's where we start. It's, 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 it's how most people start working on stories. Hey, thank you, Shy Red Fox. Yay, thank you. Um, <laughs> I appreciate this, the sub. Um, but yeah, that's how most people start playing with stories is we're taking stories we like and tweaking them because it's a lot easier and more accessible than inventing something from scratch. So, hey, that itself is not the problem. The, the big thing here is, um, and, uh, and, and I think this is where we can get into a little bit of cautionary tale for people today, is just because I have completed it does not mean I need to put it out in the world with my name on it. Um, and again, not throwing shade at this guy. He was super proud of getting published at 16 and there weren't many opportunities for that. So, so there we go. But what I see that worries me, honestly, um, cause I'm in so many online writing groups and, um, and communities and things where I'm seeing so much pressure to get, get work out, get work out early. You know, no, no, no. Just let the readers give you feedback. No, no, like that's not their job, right? They have paid for a book. They want to enjoy it. They're not there to coach you on your craft. That's your job. And then you don't charge for work until you have learned how to do your job. That's, you know, my theory. But, um, but I see so many people saying, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm, I've just started my first book. and I've already started, you know, my website, my Kickstarter, whatever. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you don't need a Kickstarter on your first book. You need to finish the first book learn from that and do another book and learn from that. Right? And it's not me being mean and it's not me being elitist. It's just legitimately your first. It, it's so weird how we have this idea that, that that's true in writing when we know it's not true in anything else. Like, oh, I have just acquired a guitar. I have, I have not learned any guitar chords. I am now learning my first three guitar chords and I'm going to release an album. And people can listen to me stumble through trying to change three guitar chords. No, that's not, no, nobody buys CDs. Or nobody buys CDs anymore anyway, but nobody buys albums of people playing the scales, right? So ah, there's my, there's my rant for today. You are allowed as a writer to take time to develop your craft and get good and do not let people pressure you on about, oh no, you know, you're not a real writer because you don't have 12 books out yet or, you know, whatever's going on. Like, no, just give yourself time. It's fine. Jeez. You're not going to time out like, oh no, I didn't get my book published by April. Therefore, literally nothing in your life changed. So, all right. There's my rant, rant, rant. Okay. What's shy is saying something. I wish I had some of my stuff from high school. Oh, I could laugh now. Oh yeah. No, there's a box in my basement someday. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes. And we have to learn to write and edit. Well, absolutely. The self-care mafia approves of taking the time to do it well. Yes. Right. And, just, and honestly, like self-care is a nice way to say that because how much angst could have been saved, <laughs> you know, you know and, and, and there's a fine line to walk because I don't want to say your first release has to be perfect because that's not going to create any issues. Right. <laughs> you know, like, no, you, you, you want it to be as good as you can get it. And then the next one you want to be as good as you can get it. And then the next one you want it to be as good as you can get it. Right. Um, I'm listening to, uh, blood and bond is in, uh, audio production right now. So I'm reviewing the audio files that, uh, Liz is sending me. Liz was on uh, stream with us a couple months ago and, um, and she's sending me things and I'm, so I'm listening to it and I'm just like, Oh, I want to edit that sentence. I can't edit that sentence. That sentence has came out two years ago and now it's in audio format and I'm not going to do that to Liz. Right. But, um, but it, everything you get, you know, you're just going to keep getting better with time and, um, or you should be right. Like 
practice doesn't make perfect. Good practice makes perfect, um, or at least better. <laughs> and yeah, so I don't want to say like it has to be perfect. But on the other hand, don't set yourself up for issues. Like you have one chance to make a good first impression. And something I used to see, and thank God I'm seeing it less often this year, which might just mean that I'm hanging out in different places. Who knows? But a couple of years ago, I saw all the time. No, no, no. Just put your book out. And if you get complaints in the reviews, then revise it and update the book. And I'm like, no, no, because first of all, how incredibly rude of you to use people who paid for the privilege of editing your work. Like, no, that's not their, you know, you pay an editor. They, they don't have people pay you to get to edit you, you know, and then you, you're not going to wipe away all those bad experiences people had, you know, so you release a book, they read it, they don't like it. And then you, you know, people are coming up, well, why aren't they giving me a second chance? I mean, I was actually seeing, why aren't they giving me a second chance? I've fixed this now. And I'm like, what? you yanked their chain, <laughs> you took their money and gave them subpar work, they're not going to come back and do it again. Right. So, ah, anyway. Um, and so I think uh, where, where I think this went wrong is, you know, you've got 16 year old Jim, more power to him. He's having, you know, write the story, Jim, no part of me regrets that you wrote the story. Um, but you know, the fanzine, you know, again, like there's not, there's not intended to be an editorial process at most fanzines. Like some fanzines were super pro and some fanzines were not. And I'm going to venture that this was less professional. Um, but I think where things got a little bit awkward, um, J.T. Rakosh, who I don't know anything about except that that is his name. And he did the illustrations that are accompanying this story. And he's associated with this fanzine in some way. And he... <laughs> But, you know, so the story is there and by Jim uh, Dice. And then it's uh, winner of the J.T. Rakosh uh, Award for Excellence is what it says. And, and I'm just like, that's, I don't know if you meant that ironically, in which case that was really mean. Or if you meant that legitimately, in which case that was also mean because you're setting this kid up for, you know, you, you should have gotten, if you wanted to give him feedback, you should have given some, him some helpful feedback, right? And that doesn't mean murdering his dreams. It just means help him to, don't set him up for then what he had to face later. There we go. We have responsibilities. Okay. That was a lot of soapboxing. Thanks for coming along on my soapbox ride. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, so that is the Eye of Argon. Um, that was our field trip for this week. And, uh, the link is in the chat. If you want to, uh, check that out, it is definitely the kind of thing that is better in groups, but you can read it by yourself. Uh, just, you know, don't try to drink things while you're reading it. So, all right. Um, does anybody have any questions or is there anything that is, uh, that, that we need to cover here? Um, it is, well, how's everybody doing with nano, by the way? I know Megan is close because she just needs to add some adjectives. Um, Grace had uh, rebel alternate nano goals this month. Shai, how are you doing? Because you were in the, um, what am I trying to say? Uh, the game of tomes, which I, I was so feeling so bad. I was catching up on a lot of words always away from the stream, so I couldn't count them. <laughs> so uh, Megan asked, do you ever publish anything else? Not to my knowledge, not that I have been able to find. Um, he did continue to hang out in the uh, community adjacent areas at least, um, but I don't think he published anything else. And I can't help but think that, you know, after that kind of experience, why would you want to publish anything else? So that's part of the reason that I'm like, hey, you know, a little bit of actual helpful feedback could have given him an entirely different view on that. And so, yeah. Um, Field trip, all right. Emphasis on trip. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, Shared Fox is in editing, but in part three, five and a half chapters left. Ooh, nice. Nice. Um, Megan, I'm not close, but I'm moving. So that's excuse in my excuse. Hey, moving is like, yeah, that's a, you're, you're excused. Yeah. You get, you can have a doctor's note. There we go. Um, <laughs> oh, thanks Shared Fox. You said, no worries. You contributed how you could. Yeah. I would show up and be like, Hey, I'm on for 20 minutes. Here's some words, then go. So for those um, 
<laughs> for those for, for whom I am saying, what I am explain, saying is completely opaque and, and lithe, lithe and opaque, like my nose. Um, Game of Tomes is a, it, uh, um, it's, it's a bunch of people hanging out on Twitch. I don't know if there's a, a central affiliation other than um, people can do it if they want to. Um, Shy, if you want to throw a link in there, if you have it handy, if not, don't worry about it. But um, you, uh, you can just get on somebody's stream and work. Actually, Grace, this might be totally up your alley. <laughs> get on somebody's stream and um, just hang out and get your words or your work in. They have word count, and then they also have adjusted word count if you're doing revisions, which is a lot of what I was doing this month because Kid and Kind is coming out very soon. Um, and, and I think uh, Shired Fox was also doing revisions uh, for things. So anyway, so there are three ways you can count. Straight words, light revisions, heavy revisions. And they have word count guides for all of those. And then... Uh, your words contribute points to different houses and that it is an absolute tournament of uh, just, you know, taking people down, rawr, houses devouring one another with word count. And it's great. But only the words that you write during somebody's stream count, which is why I was largely useless this month. I'm sorry. So <laughs> good. Okay. Um, Gentle Nano, where progress was the goal. Absolutely, yes. And this is the thing I love about Nano, and I did a whole rant on Nano last year, so I'm going to try not to recap that entire soapbox just now, but NaNoWriMo is a tool. You use the tool how it helps you. Yeah, so there we go. Okay. You really like the words you did with it. Great! Yes, if you, if you like the words you write, that is definitely progress. Okay. Thanks for the link. Yeah, I know. I knew. I knew Game of Tomes was about to end, but also um, you do it more than once a year, I think, right? Or maybe I invented that. But I'm pretty sure it was happening at least twice. So, um, so yeah, it's something people can just kind of follow and keep an eye on if you are the kind of person who um, I am really, really bad at social writing. Like if I do write-ins or something, I go to a write-in just to be socially supportive, not because I get very many words done because that's just not how I work. But I have friends who that is their most productive time. And it's a great way to have kind of a virtual socially supportive write-in. So yeah, Sable, Sable Aradia is the um, uh, Game of Tomes organizer. So, okay. Yes, the tourney starts in April with Nano Camp. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Shyred Fox, for putting those in. So it, this is our time, um, and I don't know. Let me actually hop over. I know Elena was um, caught out. She was delayed out today, so I don't know if she is going to be streaming tonight or not. Let me take a sneak peek and see if she's that. <laughs> Grace says, yeah, I work better with an audience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, and that's the thing. Like, there are, there are people who... Um, Kate, who I don't think Kate's in the chat tonight, but Kate is super productive if you send her a coat to a coffee shop. If I go to a coffee shop, I'm useless. Like, that is not how I work. So, hey, you know what? There's more than one right way to get things done. And if things are getting done, then it is a good way to get things done. So. All right. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to peek, sneak peek and see where Elena is. Hold on. Uh, yeah, I don't see her. She's not, she's not live. So we will, oh, hang on. I wanted to talk about Ken and Kind. Please indulge me. <laughs> I want to talk about Ken and Kind. So, um, the, uh, things that I am trying here and you guys are going to hear it here first because nobody's heard this yet. Um, although I did drop a hint to my patrons. Um, but the so kin and kind is wrapped up i'm doing final 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 layout tweaks and then that will be done within the next 24 48 hours officially release day the pre-order that has been up for a year is christmas eve december the 24th my patrons who i am you know trying to uh to re reward for being awesome and cool and hanging out with me are gonna get it early so, um, so that's a, that's a thing that I'm going to, excuse me, I'm experimenting with, um, my, my Patreon and, um, just trying to be open with you guys on how things are, cause it's all an experiment. So, Hey, learn from my mistakes, save time and money on your, on your end. Um, so they're going to get it early and then there's a chance that it's going to come out ahead of pre-order 
if I can make all the technology gremlins work, uh, because, 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 because I'm trying to make people happy. So there we go. Okay. Oh, what is, oh no, I don't, oh, <laughs> okay, sorry, I missed, I missed the, missed the conversation. Shared Prax says, yeah, I do not, but I still stream my writing. Yeah, I, I am impressed by people who can stream their writing. That is something that just makes me incredibly, like, I don't know. I'm just so impressed when you guys do. I just, I'm just not comfortable doing it. Um, part of it is to like, I'm working on book four of a series. I don't some, want somebody watching me try to write the climax of book four. Right. Um, and maybe that's just me being pretentious and precious about my work, but I would be mad as a reader to sign in and then go, Oh wow. That, that, what is, that is, um, so that the other hand, the charity stream that I did last year, which I thought very briefly about doing it this year, and I just didn't have time to get one properly organized. So that's something I might do again in the future. Um, but the charity stream I did last year where I just was like, Hey, let's start with zero words at the beginning of the day and, and put stuff together. Um, you know, I, I, that I did, and I did, I didn't do it because I enjoyed it. I did it because I like raising money for charity, <laughs> but, but yeah. So, okay. All right. Um, so anyway, okay, where am I going? Yeah, so Megan, who is one of uh, one of my Patreon family, Megan, watch for watch for that. It should come, hopefully, pretty soon. I can't give you a day. I'm sorry because that's going to depend on several things that are not in my control. But when I can, that'll happen, and then uh, and then it, hopefully it'll come out early for everybody as well. Be my that'll be my Christmas present. Yay! Pre-order comes out early. All right. So that said, I did want to talk about that. Yay. Okay. Megan is excited. I am excited. I am so excited. I'm trying so hard to stick this landing guys. Let me just be really super transparent for a minute. <laughs> I am so much better at creating drama and problems than I am at resolving drama and problems. And I'd be really happy if this story just went on for like another 12 books. So I didn't have to, to solve everything and stick this landing, but I worked really hard to stick the landing and, um, and one of my beta reader cried and somebody else came back and said she was rereading it. So I'm really hoping that means it went well. So we'll see. I think she was crying for a good reason, not just because it was a terrible ending. I think we'll try. Okay. Yeah. Resolution. Resolution is hard, man. All right. And also just like, sorry, soapbox again. Life doesn't just end. Like there are no neat starts and stops. Everything is based on what has happened before and everything influences what comes after it. You know, hi, oh, everything is connected. Who would have said that at some point in the past? So, um, so it's really, really hard for me to wrap up stories because I'm always thinking of, well, and then the logical outcome is this, and then the logical next step with that. And then this would happen because of that. And it's just so hard for me to find where the stop point is, which is how I end up with big fat fantasies in the first place, I guess. Oh, you have your predictions. Oh, okay. All right. Yay. Okay. I'm going to do one more quick check. It looks like Elena is not on. What if we jump over into Love Thy Nerd? Uh, Love Thy Nerd is a channel that um, I don't follow that closely. Sorry, guys. It's nothing personal. It's just usually their schedule and my schedule don't match up that well. Um, but first of all, Love Thy Nerd is a pretty awesome name. And um, yeah, so let's let's jump there where our raid call is going to be. Everything is connected. I have absolutely no idea what they're doing right now. Let's find out. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Everything is connected. Hey guys, thanks for joining me. And Oh, keep your eye out in December. Uh, speaking of writing live on stream, uh, coming up, Rhonda Parrish and I are going to be doing live editing on stream. So if that's not soul bearing. I don't know what is, but we do it because we love you. And then you can hopefully learn from our mistakes. So that's it. I will see you guys next week. Take care. Maybe, maybe. Probably should have done that countdown a little bit more accurately. There we go. There's the raid. <laughs> All right. Now we're going. Everything is connected. See you guys.